evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here. Welcome to the Sophia Nobel Oration Lecture, supported by DBT Star College Status. We, the Department of Chemistry, very proudly present to you the lecture on genetic scissors rewriting the code of life. We have with us Dr. Chakrabarti, who will be addressing us and giving us an information about the Nobel talk. May I request uh, my head of the department, Dr. Ignat Mendes, to give us the welcome address. Dr. Mendes, over to you. Thank you, Tanas. A very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Debojiti Chakraborty, CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, New Delhi, to our respected principal, Sister Ananda, who was just here a little few, I think she's also there with us, to the different faculty members of other institutions, as well as Sophia College, and also to our students from other colleges who are listening in, as well as Sophia College. A very, very warm welcome to all of you. It is our great endeavor at Sophia College to have this Sophia College Nobel Oration Lecture Series. It is almost about 20 years from now that we had begun this, I think it's the 18th year, sorry, 18th year, which we have begun this series. And we have been consistently every year conducting this oration for the different faculties and fields of science. But in addition to this year, we have added two more faculties, namely the field of economics, as well as political science to this Nobel oration series. This series helps our students to catch up with the world in the latest fields of research and gives them a glimpse of what is happening across the world in something which is of recent. Today's speaker is Dr. Jebojiti Chakraborty, CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, who has a very good, dedicated and devoted team of research scholars working in the field of basic and transitional research using the CRISP-Cas technology for their various genomic studies. Also, he has worked in this field for quite a long time. He's done his PhD from Max Planck Institute of Molecular Biology and Genetics and has a vast amount of experience, which is there to share with us. My dear students, today also, I have this Assam connection with Sophia College, which I would like to mention that one of our students, Chainika, who finished her MSc Analytical Chemistry at Sophia College just about two months ago, she was appointed as the project associate for the CSIR NIST Jorat SM scholarship, which is involving the field of research of polymers, polymeric membranes, and composites for the sustainable development of the petroleum industry. So Chinika, all the way from SM, did her MSc in analytical chemistry and back again has gone to Jorat SM and joined there. It's a very proud sense of feeling which we at Sophia College have. Having said these few words, I now get back to Tanaz to continue the lecture. Thank you, Tan. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. May I now request Ms. Chrisanne Miranda to uh, briefly introduce our speaker. Over to you, Chrisanne. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I, Krizan Miranda, feel privileged to introduce our renowned speaker for this evening, Dr. Debo Jyoti Chakraborty. Dr. Chakraborty has done his master's in molecular biology from West Bengal. He obtained his PhD from Max Planck Institute of Molecular Biology and Genetics and Technical University, Dresden, Germany. In 2016, he joined as a scientist fellow at CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, New Delhi. He is currently a senior scientist at CSIR IGIB, Delhi. Dr. Chakraborty has his own lab 
called as the RNA Biology, which is a team of young postdocs, PhDs, and research fellows who dedicate their work towards basic and translational research using CRISPR CAS technology for developing point of care diagnostics and gene editing based treatment of monogenic diseases like sickle cell anemia. The lab has been focusing on understanding neurodevelopmental diseases using organoids or mini brains. Dr. Chakraborty has been awarded the CSIR, INSA, Merck, and Lady Tata Young Investigator Awards. He is one of the 30 EMBO Young Investigators of 2020. Our young scientist is not all about mind, but also a combination of art and science. To be more precise, he is also a renowned sitar player as well. With that, I request Dr. Chakraborty to take over and enlighten us with the topic, Genetic Scissors Rewriting the Code of Life. Before Sir begins, I request all the participants to put their questions in the YouTube chat box. They will be addressed after the talk. Over to you, sir. Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me clearly. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you, particularly uh, Principal Ma'am and all the rest uh, of the teachers and the and the, the people who are here today um, helping with this meeting for the very kind introduction. I think it was uh, quite overwhelming <laughs> uh, introduction. I uh, just uh, one of the other you know scientists uh, who are who are contributing in their own small ways. So I think nothing special, more special than that. But nevertheless, it's a it's a it's an absolute uh, privilege knowing that you are hosting these uh, noble uh, oration lectures for a long period of time. I think eighteen years, as uh, Sir was mentioning. So it's, a, it's an honor that you have called me today here. And I will tell you a little bit about the Nobel Prize. Um, what is the research that has got, got the Nobel Prize this year uh, in chemistry? And also how it is extremely deeply connected to the work that we are doing uh, in, the, in the lab. So with that, I'll like to share my screen and uh, go ahead from there. So. Please let me know if you can see my slides. Yes, sir. Great. Okay, so I have uh, purposefully called the the talk today the rewriting the code of life. I believe we have uh, people from the background of chemistry. Uh, some maybe some biochemistry uh, and graduate students, probably that's uh, most of the audience. So it would be a mix of um, some uh, little advanced topics, some little generalized topics. I'll try my best to keep it simple. If you do not um, uh, follow or have any queries, um, kindly let the, the admin know so that uh, I can answer them. Maybe I can answer them at the end of the talk. So I have uh, called this topic as rewriting the code of life because as you might know that the code of life is the DNA, uh, which is present in every individual and uh, it's present inside the cell, inside the nucleus. And whatever is written in that DNA for an individual shapes the individual as a human being. So in terms of, let's say, how the color of the skin is or uh, whether the person is developing baldness or whether he or she develops some kind of a disorder which is running in the family, all this uh, is information is stored uh, in the DNA of an organism. And for a long period of time, it was believed that we are the product of whatever DNA that we are born with or whatever is the genetic sequence that we are born with. Um, and it indeed is revolutionary when somebody can come up and say that, well, that's not completely true. The reason is that it is now possible to actually change that DNA sequence. So when you change the DNA sequence, naturally you are actually rewriting the code of life because you are really changing the way that an individual can interact with the 
uh, you know, environment due to certain types of sequence changes in the DNA of that organism. How to do that is basically the topic of the Nobel Prize Award uh, in 2020. And the broad area in which it has won this is called CRISPR-Cas9 or clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. I will go into details of that. But suffice to uh, know this that it has been quite a remarkable year. Uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, two wonderful um, molecular biologists who have actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, this year. And they have won it for the development of a method for genome editing. Now, what does genome editing mean? Genome editing means that you make changes specifically in the genome of an organism. And they showed how this can be done. It's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, oftentimes the, uh, the impact that genome editing has had on medicine and therapy and for that matter, any field is quite uh, difficult to put it into words because as I will show you in the coming slides, it has been a, one of those path making discoveries which has shaped or let's say changed the way that people look at science in this case, particularly for therapy and, uh, and medicine. And this year particularly has been in many ways the year of women in every field, right? If you look at biology, if you look at, um, you know, politics around the world, if you look at so many other different fields, I think it has been really championing the cause of women. Um, it uh, has showed how, how, you know, powerful uh, the leadership in different uh, fields, uh, the women leadership have actually come ahead and it has been quite remarkable. So it's only, it's only, uh, just that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for CRISPR actually also went to, uh, to wonderful uh, women scientists. The field of CRISPR, um, as I have written here, has two heroes. Well, that's not absolutely true. Uh, and that's why I, I kind of uh, put this slide also again here that it's any field in, in science is not made uh, by one or two individuals or it's not shaped by one or two individuals. It's because of the work that is done by a lot of people over a long period of time. And while we do celebrate the Nobel Prize coming to this uh, exceptional scientists, uh, the field of CRISPR in general um, had started in the 1980s um, when certain seminal discoveries were made. And then it progressed through the next two decades uh, due to work by some fantastic uh, researchers all over the world who actually tried to shape it into the form that it is currently uh, being used as. And no less are these three individuals right at the top, which are not even humans. These are viruses, bacteria, and archaea from where the CRISPR actually originates. So if we have to understand CRISPR, we have to understand where it all came from. And as it turns out, this is a type of bacterial adaptive immunity um, uh, of which the CRISPR system is a part of. So this particular slide shows you how the genesis of CRISPR happens and what it means. So this is a bacterial cell. A bacterial cell is invaded by invaders in the form of viruses. And this virus, uh, as you can see on the top left uh, corner, uh, it introduces its genetic material, which is a DNA, into the bacterial cell. And what the bacterial cell does is takes a part of this DNA and then it puts it into its own genome at a specific point. And this almost behaves like a librarian, is, as you might have in your um, in your college as well. When a, when the librarian sees that a new book is being brought by the library, um, then the librarian puts a tag on that book so that you know that next time that somebody wants to issue that book, you can look that tag up and then you can uh, basically issue that book. So the bacteria basically does a similar kind of a thing. It uses a small part of the DNA of the virus puts it inside its own um, uh, in DNA and keeps a watch that whether that's, that small part is a, like a signature for a next event of the same invasion happening in future. So it's immunity, right? We all know about immunity now because of the COVID crisis, but it was quite fascinating to understand that a very, very simple organism, we can, almost we cannot call them simple anymore, but uh, bacteria actually have such a sophisticated and high profile immune system. So what happens is next time when the same virus attacks the bacteria, as you see on the right top, uh, then it uses the information from its own genome where it had stored a piece of that foreign DNA 
to identify whether this new viral DNA, which the bacteriophage has introduced, is really foreign DNA or not. And if it matches, then it launches an attack on that viral DNA uh, using a complex machinery of proteins and RNAs, and then it chops it off into pieces, uh, thereby uh, eliminating the viral DNA from the cell. And the way that it does that, this RNA and protein, this is the CRISPR complex. This is the CRISPR complex, which can specifically recognize a viral sequence of interest and then chop it into pieces. And that's what has been adapted into a uh, genome editing technology by the uh, Doudna and the Charpentier groups. So what does genome editing essentially mean? Genome editing means that you know you identify a target and you it could be in the DNA of an organism and then you home into that region, you add a modification and you save that information. Well, that's uh, you know very easily said uh, than done. And it took almost 60 years for scientists to come up with an idea that would be so robust, so efficient that it can actually be done. But the question is that, you know, where are you doing this genome editing? Because that leads uh, to a large number of other uh, important uh, things to understand. For example, if you want to make these edits, you could possibly do this in the cells of the body. One can take the skin cells maybe and do them. Um, or you can possibly do it in the germline, in the, in the ovum or in the spermatogonial cells, for example. Or uh, one can even think of doing it in the embryo. Now, one can definitely do it, but then the ethical questions uh, regarding embryonic genome editing comes across as to what is allowed, what is not allowed, and uh, you know what is the impact that it can have. We'll come to that later on. The next is how do you want to do this genome editing? Do you want to take out the cells from the body and then do this on these cells? Or do you want to put in your genome editing proteins right inside the body and do it in vivo? Finally, why are we doing genome editing in the first place? Uh, are we trying to correct a disease? Are we trying to prevent a disease? Uh, well, disease correction definitely is a bona fide reason. Disease prevention, it still goes a little bit into the controversial zone because we are not sure if uh, what you do would actually prevent a disease because we understand very little about the biology of diseases still. But then when it goes into the direction of improvement and design, that's when a lot of important ethical pertinent questions come in as to what is considered as design and whether everybody um, who, who has accessibility to genome editing uh, would get the chance for actually doing such kind of things. Because theoretically, it is possible to make cells uh, let's say undergo a process where you do not feel pain anymore. Now that's a you know wonderful thing to have if you're thinking of let's say a defense where uh, your army would be not feeling any pain because you have mutated the genes that are pain receptors and therefore they would be extra strong. They would be able to fight. Or for example, you grow people with the high you know very strong muscles, make them uh, engaged in that kind of a warfare. But the question is that doesn't it therefore um, uh, make it so unbalanced in terms of what you can do to push, uh, push genome editing only for the people who can afford it and thereby make them superpowers. So all these are ethical issues that are surrounding genome editing due to which there are very, very specific rules and regulations uh, that have been pulled into place. Nevertheless, it's a very powerful technology. I'll just go make you go through an, uh, a small animation to explain what I did and also tell you how this works inside the cell. Sorry. So uh, as, you can, uh, as I told you already, when a virus attacks a bacterial cell, uh, this is what a virus looks like. It looks like almost like an alien spaceship. It puts its genetic material and uh, that's the double-stranded DNA which goes inside the cell. And once uh, it goes there, like I told you, the bacteria quickly assembles a complex of a protein and an RNA. This RNA, as in shown in red, um, is called the guide RNA. And the protein is the Cas protein or the Cas9 protein. And they together go and identify the viral uh, uh, DNA as a, as a foreign DNA. They base pair with it, the RNA and the DNA. And then they make a incision on the DNA at a very precise location, thereby chopping off the DNA so the virus is unable to replicate anymore. Now, what the scientists uh, did is that they they took this assemble, you know, the assembled complex, and put it now for a different purpose altogether, where uh, the assembled complex was put inside a human cell. 
and it was told that instead of finding any bacterial DNA, find precisely a sequence on the human DNA with which that RNA would be able to base pair. Now, once it did that, the same principle was followed, the base pairing happened, and then this uh, Cas9 actually cleaved the human DNA at a very precise location. It formed a double standard break. Now, when there is a break on a human DNA, um, it is not like the bacterial or the viral DNA where it, it gets chopped off. It is immediately repaired. So the cell tries to repair it by several different repair pathways. And in the process, it can do either a very correct job or a, uh, some kind of a uh, error, error prone job. But it has been seen that during the break, if there is a small piece of foreign DNA, uh, which is introduced inside the cell at that precise location and, and that point on the cell cycle, this is, as you can see over here, this is the single-stranded DNA that is entered. And it has got some level of what is called as a homology or similarity. Then you can introduce this foreign DNA at the site of the break, which is really powerful because that basically means you can correct cells. These cells could be any cells of the body by introducing a foreign, uh, sequence at that point or a disease or it could be in a single cell like you see over here and you can generate uh, you know transgenic organisms which are different and so on so uh, like i said that the 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 basic premise is that you have the uh, cas protein which is shown here in golden and the rna which is shown here in blue which is opening up double stranded dna uh, and then base pairing with that and then causing the break uh, on the double strand uh, of the DNA. And the cell tries to repair it um, using two different pathways. In one pathway, it is not a very precise pathway due to which it introduces insertions and deletions that is generally followed in the lab in order to study the roles played by certain proteins. And uh, the other way is called a homology directed repair, uh, shown on the right, where you, if you introduce a small piece of donor DNA, as they call it, then this donor DNA can specifically get integrated at the break site. And uh, once that happens, you can actually make a precise genetic change at the site that you want to do. So it's a very, very simple method um, uh, compared to the, you know, the techniques that were there at that point of time to really introduce a change in a DNA, in a, in a given part of the DNA, if you can assemble this whole complex together. And uh, with the help of that, you know, people have done wonders. They have made, like I said, primate engineering by putting in the changes, uh, let's say in the sperm or in the ovum and then putting it into a surrogate mother. And then you have um, the next generation which are expressing certain types of qualities, um, genetic changes. People have actually done gene screening of all the 20,000, 25,000 genes and the 100,000 long non-coding RNAs that are there in the genome by knocking each one of them out and understanding what is the, what is the purpose of uh, individual proteins and individual genes in certain contexts. All this has been made possible because of uh, CRISPR, the, the whole uh, uh, process of doing these kind of studies. Uh, since the Cas9 is a protein that interacts with the DNA, you can uh, put a fluorescent tag or a reporter tag on that Cas protein, and then you can express that inside the cell so that you can see the DNA moving or the chromosomes moving. And this is um, uh, lighting up the telomere regions, which are the ends of the chromosomes, uh, as you can see over here. And then people have understood the dynamics of telomeres, how they move and so on. So this is uh, called Cas fish. And it is also now possible to make CRISPR-based genetic circuits where one gene product is driving the expression of another gene product or repressing another gene product and so on through synthetic promoters uh, and conventional uh, promoters as well. So all these type of activities can be done thanks to CRISPR because it's so easy to now build uh, these kind of looping and logic gates inside the cells. Which of course means that if you can do so many things, what are the things that should be probably you know not done um i think several of you might have heard about this uh, in china where uh, the human embryonic genome editing was done and uh, there were twin spawn who were whose embryo were edited using crispr and there was a lot of human cry the reason being that the the argument in favor of that was that you would make the baby um, uh, hiv resistant in the, in the in the future uh, but the counter argument was that in the process of doing that one would make that uh, that uh, individual 
who would be born more susceptible to West Nile virus infection, for example. And secondly, we are not even sure about the harmful effects of CRISPR. We are still learning it. We are right at the, at, uh, at the you know, understanding it uh, to depth. So why would one uh, rush into these kind of experiments? Um, and of course, the thirdly, the most important ethical point of view that, you know, for an embryo, which means that's, a, that's, a, that's an individual who is not born yet, uh, did not have a choice to decide whether uh, he or she would want to have her genome edited so that's a more of a, uh, a more of an ethical question in terms of whether um, an embryo uh, you know editing an embryo is actually leaving any choice uh, for the individual born uh, to have uh, this kind of editing done so all these are questions that have uh, been raised and as a result of which currently it is not allowed to perform any kind of human embryonic genome editing. Uh, for research purposes, it is allowed to do a very, very, um, you know, tightly controlled uh, regulatory, um, you know, controlled uh, experiments up till the day of 14th, after which the embryo has to be discarded for doing these kind of experiments. Uh, but needless to say that, you know, it has an infinite scope of applications and, you know, there is hardly a field uh, at the moment, whether you talk about physics or chemistry or biology, that has not been touched by CRISPR because it's so powerful. It is so, um, you know, it has applications everywhere. And, uh, mm, you know, people are using CRISPR, let's say the International Space Station to understand certain aspects. People are using CRISPR for bringing back the woolly mammoth back to life, uh, you know, extinct species back to life and so on. And it's been there in every field. Perhaps the field which has uh, received the most attention is uh, human diseases because uh, it has shown promise to actually correct diseases once and for all, which was almost impossible to think of, let's say even uh, 10 years back. So that's where the most applications of CRISPR and most um, of the interest of CRISPR lie. And I will talk to you in the next two uh, segments about the work that we are doing uh, along those lines. So one of the big success stories of CRISPR has been for sickle cell anemia. Uh, it's a blood disorder. And um, why it's a success story was that just in 2019, the first patient in the USA was given a CRISPR dose um, to correct the sickle cell anemia mutation. And uh, one year down the line, now currently in 20, 2021, uh, the patient is doing very well and has no signs of the disease. So it is being championed as uh, that, you know, Know, as, a, as a success for CRISPR trial and uh, possibilities of CRISPR trial coming in for other diseases is happening um, more and more. And there are companies which are doing this. Uh, this is the patient, Victoria Gray, who, who actually received the CRISPR treatment and her life is of course uh, improved after, after this. Now, what happens in sickle cell anemia is that the blood, which is normally red blood cells, which are normally circular, these actually become sickle shaped and they become like half moon due to which the oxygen carrying capacity in that uh, in these cells go down. And uh, they, un, you know, they suffer from a large number of other different uh, the complications, it could be stroke, it could be painful episodes, and there's also death uh, as well. But that sickle cell anemia, um, although the trial has happened in the USA, it's not a disease of the of the of the West. It's not a disease that is happening more in the in the Western part of the the globe. But rather, in certain countries like India, India actually shares more than greater than fifty percent of the sickle cell carriers across the world, as you see from this map over here. So it's hugely prevalent in uh, different um, belts of India, particularly in the rural population, which do not have access to healthcare and so on. And it is due to a point mutation, which means a single nucleotide changes um, uh, from GAG to GTG. You know, DNA has this four alphabet, A, T, G, and C. And one of this alphabet in the beta globin chain, which causes the uh, making of the human, you know, hemoglobin, uh, causes the sickle cell anemia. So when I started my lab, um, just after uh, finishing my PhD and postdoc from abroad, uh, and I came back to India, um, this was the first thing that I started with is to identify a way by which we could, uh, through a proof of concept using CRISPR, be able to correct this mutation in Indian patient derived stem cells. 
Uh, and uh, to cut a long story short, what we did is that we actually worked or, you know, extensively characterized an orthogonal Cas protein uh, from a bacteria called Francisella novicida. Cas9 is the protein, CRISPR protein, which I talked about. And through a multiple experiments showed that this protein is highly suitable for doing therapeutic correction of diseases. One, because it can introduce that foreign DNA, which would be the corrected DNA very easily inside the cells. But more importantly, it is very, very specific, meaning that it can distinguish a DNA from another piece of DNA, which is different by only one mismatch or one nucleotide difference, uh, which means that if you put it inside the cell, uh, it will be very specifically going and targeting only that region of interest which you are uh, working for. This is very important because normally if you take a Cas protein from other species of bacteria and you put it inside the cell, it doesn't only go to the site in which you are sending it to. It also goes and binds to other parts of DNA and potentially cleaves them. Now that's a bit dangerous because if you want to cleave, let's if you want to target, let's say sickle cell anemia and end up targeting P53, which is important for cancer, then you can imagine what is going to happen. So specificity is a big issue in the CRISPR field. And we felt that, you know, this particular protein might uh, be able to solve it partially. And as a proof of concept, we took an Indian patient uh, of sickle cell anemia. We converted the patient cells into uh, stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. We corrected the mutation using FNCAS9, and we showed that this is indeed working. You can actually do that. So uh, this uh, was highlighted in, a, in, a, in the journal PNAS. Uh, it came in 2019 um, as uh, you know, as, as an, as it's more an academic than anything else because we really had a disease to be cured, right? We, it was not just for academic publication, but we really wanted to take it to a point where let's say down the line in a couple of years, we would be able to really see whether such kind of a CRISPR technology for correcting disorders therapeutically can be initiated also in India. But we are not there yet. The reason being that uh, in order to make sure that uh, you correct a disease, we needed to make this correction happen in at least, let's say 20 to 30% of the cells and which we were not getting using this first generation CRISPRs. Um, and this 20, 30% is something that doctors over several, several years and decades have understood uh, that if you, you know, have a normal, normal um, uh, RBCs, which do not have the mutation uh, in at least 20 to 30% of the RBCs, then these have a selective advantage over the sickled RBCs and therefore, they persist longer and over time they outgrow. So which means that, you know, even if you do not correct 100% of your cells, even if you correct just 20 to 30%, that is enough in order to, uh, in, in order to correct the disease per se. So that's what that was the whole point. And uh, how we would do that is that we would take the cells from a patient, we would uh, make the correction there, and then we would uh, possibly return it uh, to the patient. Uh, and hopefully these will now engraft into the bone marrow and um, the new blood blood cells, which would be the gene corrected blood cells would then take over. Um, and we thought that, well, at that point of time, that it's it's a very difficult process because it's, uh, you know, you have to work with so many different aspects of it. It's not a trivial thing to simply take out blood and then uh, do gene correction because everything works inside a, inside a lab in a, in, a, in a very, very controlled conditions. But when you are thinking of a therapeutic approach, uh, it's, it's, uh, it requires coming together of so many different aspects. So um, we felt that, you know, this was not something that we could do ourselves only. And we started collaborating some of with some of the leaders uh, in this field uh, at the University of Tokyo. We started engineering this protein uh, to make it much more efficient, to much more uh, correct high, at a higher level at UCSF. And uh, now also uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Seattle, we decided to start uh, looking at in vivo validations and preclinical testing. Uh, at NIH and National Eye Institute, we looked at the possibilities of using adeno-associated viral vectors to make uh, these vectors be able to package and, and put them inside the cells uh, and so on. And the idea was that, you know, it, we, this, was a, this was a paper that came in 2018, 19, actually, uh, in the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that a, a young uh, patient who was diagnosed in 2016 with a rare genetic disease 
could actually be given a dose of a, uh, of, of a particular drug, in this case, as an antisense oligonucleotide um, in 2018. So that's as, as a time, smaller time window that you can think of, it's in two years, within which not only was the diagnosis, the identification referral was done, but an entire new treatment regimen was completed, whereby you could finish all the preclinical trials, toxicological studies, permissions, etc., which which was which is almost uh, sometimes unthinkable of because papers tend to move very slowly when you look at clinical trials but i think the entire vaccine episode has shown that um, it doesn't really have to go in that direction or it doesn't really have to be that slow if there is um, the motivation to go ahead uh, with a clear cut incentive uh, which is to give relief and bring comfort to people uh, then and if there are people who have you know you have the the all types of people coming with the same kind of mindset then such kind of an activities can be done even in a very short period of time so uh, we figured out that if we had to use this for sickle cell anemia correction uh, we would need one a higher efficiency variant of the protein we would need appropriate vectors to deliver it inside the cells and of course we would need robust preclinical data uh, I'm not going to share much about it. This was a uh, work that we started some time early, but uh, uh, due to uh, due to some uh, uh, you know some IP issues, I won't be able to show details. But essentially, we are quite advanced in this uh, in this um, pathway where uh, we have not only have developed higher efficiency variants, uh, but currently we're actually testing appropriate vectors um, and uh, generating, trying to generate robust preclinical data. So I'm very hopeful that in a, in a year or two, we would be able to start um, uh, maybe perhaps go towards clinical trials uh, in India for, for this kind of diseases using CRISPR. So with that, I'll come to the next part of my talk. I think um, uh, Feluda is something that uh, has got a lot of attention in the media over the last uh, few months or so. So I think this is something that um, some of you already have heard about. But essentially, it's uh, a repurposing of the CRISPR technology uh, <clears throat> from simple genome editing to sorry, to use it as a therapeutic, uh, to use it as a diagnostic platform. And this is work that I did with uh, with Dr. Shobik Maiti, who is a colleague and uh, uh, a collaborator in this entire project at IGIB. Uh, why the name Feluda? I think um, for some of the people who are accustomed with uh, Bengali literature or who are Bengalis themselves would know that uh, you know Feluda is a fictional detective uh, in, in the stories of Satyajit Ray, who was a very famous uh, uh, children's story writer and, and uh, director. Um, and the, it's an acronym. The full form is FN Cas9 Editor Linked Uniform Detection Assay. That's a Feluda uh, acronym. And we called it Feluda because at that time when we started working on this there were two um, technologies uh, one from MIT and the other one from University of California Berkeley um, which were also using a different CRISPR platform for detection and they called it Sherlock and detector respectively so when we made a detection platform using Cas9 that we developed we wanted to give it an Indian name and when you have two Bengalis in the team that's the that's the result so Feluda is a, is it is, is a CRISPR diagnostics um, and it has received a lot of uh, um, I think there was a lot of uh, media attention, unnecessary ones, I would say, because there are a lot of similar technologies and, uh, and great science happening from the rest of the country as well. But, but it's now a technology which has been licensed, commercialized, it's available in the market, and it has also been validated and uh, approved by uh, ICMR and DCGI uh, to be a diagnostic for SARS-CoV-2 uh, to replace the RT-PCR. So it's uh, as accurate as the RT-PCR test, the gold standard test. Uh, incidentally, the person who used to play uh, Feluda in, in movies was uh, Shomitra Chatterjee, a very famous Bengali actor, actually passed away. And there was a very moving tribute that was written um, uh, uh, in, in November, uh, comparing the character and the, and the paper strip test, uh, CRISPR based test. So it was a, it was a quite, quite a touching um, point for, uh, for most of us who were working on this, uh, on this aspect of, of CRISPR diagnostics. So what we are using in Feluda essentially is a repurposing of this FN Cas9 protein that I told you um, to use the high specificity of this Cas protein to now differentiate between two substrates, one uh, with which um, there is a complete match of the RNA and the other which, with, which is a substrate which has got a one single mismatch, basically a point mutation. 
and you can use this property to distinguish uh, two substrates that are different by a single nucleotide and then get a readout in various forms. It could be an on agarose gel or a fluorescence based or as I will show you in a lateral flow device. It could also be used to blindly identify uh, from blinded samples, identify um, homozygous, you know, the, the, the mutations that are causing diseases like Mendelian diseases, even the heterozygous ones, which are carriers of diseases. And we perform this uh, with 100% accuracy on blinded samples. And it can also be used uh, for, let's say, screening of pathogenic organisms, such as in this uh, bottom one, we showed, um, we worked with uh, Dr. Govind Makharia at Ames, uh, New Delhi, uh, who came and told us that, you know, he has patients uh, who are suffering from helicobacter pylori infection, which causes, um, you know, uh, it's um, peptic ulcers, which cause that, and they come with a lot of pain. And uh, this Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria which also has a mutant form, which is not um, uh, responsive to the first line antibiotic, which is given, which is rifampicin. Uh, and due to this mutation, these uh, they do not uh, they they do not respond to this antibiotic. And um, it is not possible to know before three to four days whether a patient has got rifampicin resistant bacterial strains or not, because what they do is they scrape from the stomach and grow them on a plate and you know culture them for three days and then they find out and then the antibiotic is changed. Uh, with Feluda, this can all be done within, uh, within an hour actually with the patient sitting at the OPD where you simply take the DNA and then identify what is the mutation. So it's a very, very versatile technique that way. And we were using really before the pandemic started this to see if you can convert this into a point of care device or a point of care technology. Um, and uh, doing this in the tertiary healthcare centers, in this case, it's in Chhattisgarh uh, district, Raipur, uh, in a village, uh, where generally the government performs uh, these very crude tests called solubility tests uh, to identify if there is any chance that a, that a person might be having sickle blood or not. And you see here in a school, there are these children lined up to take their, uh, to give their blood. There is a person who pricks the blood. And if you look at uh, this particular queue, there is this uh, small kid who doesn't have um, uh, slippers, uh, who is uh, quite apprehensive about the prospects of giving blood to, uh, to, the, to the individual sitting there. So we thought that, you know, how to make this a little bit more uh, child friendly because uh, identifying carriers is very important and it's very good to do this in the tertiary care center. So we came up with the idea that the children can be asked to simply spit into a small tube. And as you can, as you know, saliva also has DNA uh, and there are materials in that tube which will lyse the cells, the DNA comes out and then the fellow the reaction can be done very quickly to identify if there is any mutation there or not. So uh, this was where we were at the beginning of the of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, then everything changed uh, when the COVID-19 struck. So we felt that this was also an opportunity where you could use the Feluda for COVID-19 diagnosis because we were using a CRISPR-based um, identification. So the principle remains the same. In this case, the sample is collected uh, for, as a from a swab or a saliva. And then an RT-PCR, not the real-time PCR, mind you, it's a reverse transcription PCR where the RNA is converted into DNA. Uh, and then a PCR amplification step on a normal PCR machine, doesn't require a qPCR or a quantitative PCR machine, uh, is done. And then we combine the CRISPR biology and the paper strip chemistry to generate a readout on a paper strip as you see over here. Uh, the advantage is that you are actually using a normal PCR machine which is present in um, in most places also perhaps in, 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 in your college as well and not a real-time PCR machine which costs about 20 times more so you can scale up much higher. It happens within an hour and um, it is highly specific. Uh, this is how it looks like. I won't go into details about the chemistry so much, but just uh, sufficient to understand that it uses a combination of nanoparticle movement, taking up the CRISPR substrate and depositing it at a streptovidin biotin interaction line. And um, at the bottom, you see how the strips look. So if there's a positive sample, uh, it's almost like a pregnancy strip. So you can have a positive uh, line, which tells you that there is a test band. And if this line is not present, then you know that the sample is actually negative. 
and uh, it's uh, you know if you are a bengali and you are followers of feluda stories you know that there are two other characters uh, which are also present in feluda stories one is uh, topshe who is the cousin um, and uh, we developed a smartphone app with a chennai based uh, you know startup where you can simply take the picture of this strip and get a readout because the smartphone app has been trained using machine learning and this is called true outcome predicted from strip evaluation and we also figured out a way by which uh, uh, you could make a web server uh, and um, make this entirely open source so anybody can come in with a sequence of interest put that sequence and you can have the fellow the design made for that sequence this is called jatayu uh, junction for target design of your analysis and target design of your fellow the asset jatayu uh, by the way is the third character in uh, fellow the stories who is a friend of uh, fellow the uh so it's a complete package um uh, that 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 seems to be coming and it's of course it's very sensitive it goes down to a few a few copies of the viral uh, starting material and um, you know now it is even possible to actually uh, make it uh, re not require the pcr machine that i showed you at all uh, you can do this using isothermal pcr whereby at a single temperature it could be a heating block or a water bath where uh, all these things can be assembled in a single pot and very quickly around 30 minutes or so one can do this uh, assay uh, the the covid-19 detection assay using this kind of a technology this was all good and uh, you know everything seems to be fine this was of course uh, licensed to tata medical and diagnostics which was a new company that was formed as a part of tata um, and then later on uh, they developed their own company and now they have a product in the market called tata md check uh, which is the commercial name of eluda uh, and i'm told that they are using it um, also in mobile vans there is an automated end to end system uh, possibly going through large um, you know places um, where this needs to be done rapidly not only in india now but also abroad but that also you know changed a little bit in the recent times when we have now have received news that there are these novel variants that have entered the population if you are following medical news you would know that you know there is the talk of the uk strain and the south african strain and so on and uh, just to explain to you you know as a virus goes um, through populations uh, and it moves from one person to another it is absolutely normal for the virus to mutate to bring some changes in the genetic material and most of these mutations actually uh, do not affect the virus's survival and they really make it weak till it goes away completely but sometimes it might so happen that certain mutations uh, tend to make the virus more resilient and remain in the in the population for longer period of time and these are dangerous dangerous um the reason is that you know when you have the vaccines that have been rolled out these vaccines have been made uh, against the parent strain and not for this new mutations so the efficacy of these vaccines for this new mutants uh, is still not understood and uh, if we go by the recent studies which have just come in the last week or so these vaccines might be less efficacious uh, for this new variants so this means that you need to track where these novel variants are uh, and also to understand how to stop spread them because otherwise there will be a more stronger and a worse form of covid pandemic as uh, has been evidenced in certain countries which have completely gone into lockdown india has been a very very interesting uh, scenario because seems to be things seem to be moving into complete normalcy here but it is like a ticking time bomb so it's very important that we do not lose our guard at this point of time because for several countries uh, it's it's very bad uh, situation and they are on high alert so the question was that you know if you have this variants how do you detect them uh, um incidentally india also have uh, there are patients who have returned to india and you know people who have returned to india from abroad where these variants have been detected so it's a, it's something that uh, the, the government is tracking very very um carefully and the question is that you know uh, how do you detect them at the moment it seems that the only technology to detect them is through sequence thing of all the genetic material because um you know diagnosis like qrt pcr and so on uh, is not something that tells uh, it's not a technology which tells you about mutations it tells you about the presence or absence of covid-19 it doesn't go and simply say that you have this particular mutation uh so we thought that it is possible to develop something based on a refn cas9 pipeline uh which has a specificity to point mutations because we did this for sickle cell anemia mind you uh for 
for the COVID-19 variants. And that's uh, what we call no surprises as Ray, uh, you know. Uh, if Feluda is uh, like, um, like uh, detects the, the COVID-19, uh, like a haystack in a barnyard, Ray is to, to actually detect a needle in that haystack. And Ray is of course uh, uh, in memory of, of Satyajit Ray. And we call this rapid variant assay because it can allow you to distinguish between two substrates uh, which are different by a single mutation. And this mutation could be the specific mutation that is present in the UK, South African, and the, and the Brazilian strains. And this is because it does not tolerate mismatches in the target, unlike the QRT-PCR, which uses uh, Tagman probes. And how this uh, does that is that, you know, you have this uh, S gene of the COVID-19 virus, which has developed these mutations, and you can uh, basically tweak around the Feluda platform a bit, we advance it a little bit, and identify these variants uh, very nicely on the, on the paper strip. One uh, which would be positive for both the variant as well as the normal S gene would have two bands uh, on two strips, whereas the one which would not have that would be the one uh, would would have a single band would be the the wild type uh, variant, which will not have the the the, the UK variant N five zero one Y in this case. We validated this on a large number of samples, and these are samples of from patients who have come to India over the last month or so from UK, uh, passing through the Delhi airport, and we see that it works pretty okay for uh, uh, through, and you know we can make it even better, and it it has been uh, it validates uh, itself on a large number of patient samples across a range of CT values, showing that yes indeed you can uh, really use this as a diagnostic uh, device very rapidly as a first pass option, and that's what is shown over here for people who are um, you know coming in international domestic passengers uh, as a first pass variant screening uh, which could be then um, taken up for sequencing in case there is a there is a need to map more variants this whole process takes about 75 minutes uh, when you consider that the alternate for this is sequencing which takes about four to five days uh, it definitely reduces the total time taken and of course cost by several orders of magnitude uh, to identify what are the variants um, in the COVID positive patients. So currently we are working on, you know, engaging with the World Health Organization to try to deploy this as quickly as possible um, for different places, try to make it very robust so that one can use it, take it up, um, and also figure out uh, how to you know, scale up the manufacturing so that it becomes is, is really useful because variants will keep on coming. It's not something that's uh, just limited to now. It will keep on coming in, in, a, in a six months, there might be new variants as well, but our diagnostic criteria and our, our developments should also be matching that so that uh, we can be able to detect it and identify ways by which we can uh, use that to stop the transmission. Uh, the last part of the talk is a little bit uh, of uh, understanding of, you know, this whole platform. I think this has been quite a, quite a, a journey because uh, the work on Felu that actually started uh, in January last year, and I'll show you uh, precisely on the date when we started this, which was not very, uh, very, uh, you know, far away from the current date. Um, it has, like I said, has received a lot of a lot of attention. Uh, but if you look at the whole process uh, during Fellow the development, we started this on January 28th, and by September we could go through the whole process of prototype, patent filing, technology licensing, and then approval by the Drugs Control and General of India. Just to tell you that this is, uh, you know, really true. Uh, on January 28th, we actually formed formed a group for coronavirus detection um, in our lab. And uh, this was before the first case was actually reported in India. It was sometime in February, I think, when the first case was reported. Uh, in March, we had, uh, you know, we could get hold of our first samples that came to National Center for Disease Control and um, validate our prototype on this uh, on the on the paper strip try to see as you can see here the, the the control band developing on the top followed by the test band a little bit later there you can see the test band developing so that was when we knew that such can have an assay can actually be developed and of course in september you had the first uh, test script which was uh, developed and approved for for use in india 
but we learned a few things along the way like i said that you know when you have to work because most of the times our ideas remain uh, stuck to labs and we are not able to you know translate them because we have different languages that we speak versus the people who are actually making these products for commercial use speak and so um, we need to have a dialogue in a common language so most of the times uh, the scientists speak in a certain type of uh, manner where we are looking more about the science and the and the corporate speak in a manner where, where we look about the production and how it has to go into 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 people's hands and so on so it took us a lot of iterations i think this number is very old uh, it's almost like 6000 7000 rounds of validations of sequence of you know samples and so on all through march to to currently and we are still doing that to identify there are so many different aspects of making a, a particular assay so robust so detailed that it can work every single time in the hands of the consumer and i think that has been the major lesson for us and it requires uh, tweaking at so many aspects whether it is the aspect of um, of of the of the raw materials to the fact that you know you need to also discuss about uh, regulatory policies and understand what is considered as a gold standard particularly when you have new tests coming into the market the other important thing perhaps the most important thing is that you know our students are our our biggest assets this is oftentimes uh, quite under uh, you know it's um, undermined a bit because you know in india we have issues with fellowships not being released on time and i keep on bringing in this slide every single time when there are people who are uh, who are hearing the talk if if some of them are belonging to our uh, our fellowship boards and and, and our uh, institutions so to understand that you know during this entire pandemic the contributions that uh, the student community has has actually made has been quite enormous the, there are i mean in my lab almost um, uh, you know 60% or 70% of the students have been covid positive at some point uh, and they have stayed during the entire pandemic period uh, not going home uh, contributing to the work and they are still doing it so it's been uh, quite a revelation working with them and uh, they are really the heroes uh, at this point of time we also realized that you know uh, like i said that raising a child requires a village but bringing a product to market particularly in a, such a short form period of time it requires the whole organization and i think everybody contributed whether uh, it's the it's the person who is is responsible for delivery of couriers during the pandemic to the whole point of the of you know the, the principal scientific advisor let's say to the prime minister who uh, frames the policies everybody who worked with us actually contributed to bringing this product to market and it's uh, quite um, quite um, uh, fantastic to see that you know this kind of communication at so many different levels um, right from the beginning feluda had you know caught a lot of attention of the media and we also learned that it can go both ways sometimes it can be very cruel particularly if people uh, take notice uh, of the work and you know we had people who were trolling abusing and so on that where is it how when does it take place and you know how uh, without understanding what a technology needs to go through um, uh, from inception to the point of validation in order to be a product in a market which normally takes about uh, you know several years uh, to push this through into a few months but the good thing is that you know social media can also be very helpful particularly for making uh, feluda accessible or or tech, you know science accessible to the general public it was a very very you know warm feeling to see that on a particular day once the approvals came uh, feluda was trending at point uh, 15 on twitter after shri krishna and press freedom so that was that was something we felt that you know at least for science uh, in india because that doesn't normally happen and when you have shashi tharoor um, you know talking about the same technology without using any one of his you know big bombastic words uh, that was also quite funny to see that you know the social media can really make science accessible to public uh, like no one else but most importantly uh, you know science stands on its own uh, and uh, you know such kind of opportunities pandemic actually gives you a kind of a kick in the back because it also pushes you and i think students have uh, have really come up with fresh new ideas and innovations this was something that uh, they developed over the last uh, few months uh, when we were trying to find a way how we can bring feluda closer to home as a point of care test um, and a, a protocol was developed where it would not require any equipment at all and this is just showing you how these things are done you put all these components into a tube um, and then it 
and just shake them and instead of a PCR machine, you can use your elbow uh, through isothermal PCR uh, where the body temperature actually generates the amplification reaction. And then you follow it up by putting in the, the buffer and then the strips and you can see the final bands coming up in some time. So this was more to see if we could develop something that was uh, that could be used closer to home. And that with that, I come to the last slide, perhaps the most important slide. Uh, there's a it's a big group, as you can see over here. Um, a lot of people working on different aspects of it, and a lot of collaborators. And uh, we are generally funded very generously by different sources, um, uh, both the national and international. And of course, Tata Medical and Diagnostics has been with us uh, through the at least for the fill of the journey uh, to make a diagnostic and then distribute it now, not just in India but also abroad. So with that, I would like to thank all of you once again. It's been a little longish presentation, I believe, but if you have questions, I would be more than happy to take them. Thank you, Chakrabarti. That was really a very enlightening session. May I now request Linnell if there are any questions to put them across to sir. Linnell, over to you. Yes, thank you. We have got a couple of questions. So the first one is, is there any correlation between the size of an organism and the immunity? I, I think I might have lost your question. Could you just repeat once? Is more? there any, yes. Is there any correlation between the size of an organism and the immunity that it possesses? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I... I have to look this up. To be very honest, I do not know the answer for this. Um, there is, of course, uh, what is called the the um, uh, sequence paradox, which uh, says that the complexity of the organism versus the size, uh, where there is uh, some inverse correlationship, I believe. But uh, I don't know the answer to this question. I have to look this up. Yeah. Okay. The next one. What happens when the gene corrected cells are rejected by the body? Is it lethal? Right. So the the rejection generally happens not at the level of the of the gene sequence being corrected or not. It generally happens whether the cells that have been corrected once they have been introduced into the body, uh, whether these are rejected or not, and that's because entirely due to the major histocompatibility complex which recognizes these cells as self or foreign um, and uh, then you know launches an immune response to these cells. So uh, yes, it could be possible that the corrected cells might be rejected by the MHC class one, class two um, molecules. Uh, but that is why uh, in addition with the, with the gene editing and the correction, there is also something called um, immunosuppressants, uh, which, are, which are not only provided, but there is also some immunomodulation that is done using bisulfan treatment and so on, uh, which prepares the body to be less uh, you know, reactive to these foreign cells, which is corrected cells. So yeah, that is, that is done routinely for such kind of tests or such kind of uh, uh, therapies. The next question, what decides the specificity of CAS to its target? The specificity of CAS to its target is, uh, is determined by two things. One is the presence of a small triplet nucleotide sequence for CAS9, uh, which is called the PAM NGG. Uh, it could also be different other sequences depending upon the species of the bacteria for this CAS is from. And the second is the sequence of the guide RNA. And this guide RNA is about 20 nucleotides long. So once the CAS finds a PAM, it opens up the DNA and this guide RNA tries to base pair one base at a time. And then if there's a complete uh, binding or a complete base pairing, the CAS becomes active and then it makes a double-stranded cleavage on the target. The next one, is Ray useful to identify all the different variants in the virus? Uh, currently, we have the possibility to detect all the 11 variants out of 20 variants, which have been concerned, uh, which have been called as variants of concern, out of which there are two variants or four variants which are clinically important, all of which can be detected by Ray. Uh, but there is a possibility that we can actually use this uh, to detect uh, nearly all the variants that are present in the virus. We are working on that. And the last one, what are you, your views on the legality and ethics of genetic scissors? 
uh so uh, my view is pretty much the same as which is the standard view in terms of uh, research on genome editing is that uh, you know the research should not stop because it uh, gives you more and more ideas of how you can progress this for different purposes um but of course uh, there are a lot of areas where we are completely trading on the unknown uh, such as for example the safety the efficacy for uh, for specific correction and so on. So till those things are not completely known, um, attempts towards uh, germline editing should not be done. It should be more limited to somatic editing and for disease correction. That would be my, my take on that. Thank you. That was all. Linel, so can now... I ask one question, please? Yes, sir, sure. Yes, sir. This is Dr. Mendes, sir, the head of the department. So it was an excellent lecture. Though I was sitting in a chemistry room, but I enjoyed the lecture tremendously. One of those biochemistry, biological lectures, which I felt I should sit to the end of the moment, sir. Excellent lecture, Thank sir. Thank you very much. Sir, I, I would like to ask a small question. Yes. What, what dictates the location and the period of the mutant variation, sir? Why do you say it happens in Brazil? Why is it happening in certain location places, sir? And you said in six months, we can expect another mutant variation. How can you predict this period as well as... Uh, uh, location sir right so to ask the to answer the first question uh, it is a completely random event uh, because uh, you know what regulates the mutations uh, and how, what controls whether a mutation is preferred over the mutations uh, is actually not just a combination of the viral strain that goes through but also the individual's genotype so if all of the countries um, that have for example if 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 one looks at the sequences that have been submitted from india there are indian specific variants as well of course they might not be clinically so so uh, dangerous that's why they are not in the news but there are indian specific variants as well so every country would have their own variations that have been introduced by the immune system of the people from that country uh, it's, it's a selective pressure on the virus why I said uh, six months, of course, it's an arbitrary number. Uh, it could be even earlier than that, or it could be late uh, in that is because the virus is continuously mutating. And as there is a, a pressure on the virus to actually get eliminated through, let's say, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, vaccines, and so on, uh, there are also certain the chance that there might be certain variants or certain mutations which might be preferred to make the virus much more uh, rapid spreading. And these are actually the, what we were, when we say that these are variants of concern, these are actually the variants of concern, which then, you know, spike up in a certain place. And then it basically, if you look at how the UK variant came up, it was started in a very, very small area, Kent, uh, in the US, uh, in the UK. And then within a couple of months, it had completely, you know, become so widespread that the parent variation, the parent uh, strain was not found anymore. It had completely overtaken the whole population. So that's how, how rapid, if you have a variant, which is let's say 60%, 70% more transmissible than the one which is not, uh, which is the parent variant. And that's how rapidly these variants can actually appear in the population. So one more question on the lighter side. You are doing so much of research and work. How do you still find time to play the sitar? I, I don't. I don't <laughs> find as much time as I I could possibly. But it it um, you know thankfully I think I've got a, a very supporting structure at home. So uh, we figure out ways by which uh, uh, we can get uh, you know some time to also devote to to music and uh, another thing. So yeah. It's, it also keeps you a little bit um, motivated, I think, because music uh, keeps your mind away from, from the daily things, science and whatever. So yeah, I, I go back to music as a means to, to unwind. Yeah. Thank you. We are done Linel, with all the... Elena, yes, can I ask yes. one question? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, so it's really very nice. This is Sarisha. Uh, sir, uh, uh, one, I don't know, it may be a very basic question, but I thought I should ask, how does it know that it has to mutate, the virus? Because we have not found any uh, medicine. I mean, is it that, uh, how does it know? How does it sense that it has to? It's a natural, so it's a, like evolution selects the fittest. Mm -hmm. uh, the mutations which make the virus uh, fit are selected. 
so it's a natural process of evolution it is not uh, any kind of um, uh, how to say um, uh, in intelligent design of any kind but as the virus moves from one organism to another one individual to another the mutations that are uh, more fit for its survival uh, would naturally get selected whereas the deleterious mutations would get eliminated i think that is the same for any kind of evolution it just happens in the case of a virus all this happens in a very very quick span of time so that means Short it is it is not response to something it is uh, it is just an responding to how the pressures of uh, different uh, factors it could be the immune system of an individual uh, the antibodies already present in an individual uh, the type of um, editing enzymatic editing uh, due to the the individuals enzymes that are uh, that are editing the sequence of the virus what is the pressure of those uh, proteins rna editing enzymes for example because this is a vir rna virus so all this actually determine um, how and then when you have so many different individuals across different geographical locations who are expressing so many different types of um, uh, you know genotypes uh, naturally the variation is also getting exposed to a wide variety of pressures and th this modulates it uh, to a large extent to understand or, or, to, or to to come up with a form uh, which sometimes might be stronger than the parent form thank you sir I think that's all with the questions. Now I would like to invite Ms. Disha Joseph to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening to one and all. On behalf of the Sophia Noble Oration Committee and the Department of Chemistry, I take this privilege to thank you, Dr. Chakrabarti, for the in-depth knowledge and expertise that you have shared with us today. It was indeed a very enriching and enlightening session. I'm sure that all of us who are present here have understood what exactly the CRI SPR Cas9 genetic scissors actually is. Thanks to your simple and down to earth explanation, sir. I also take this opportunity to thank our principal, Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mahal for all her support and encouragement. A big thank you to the internal quality assurance cell of our college for providing us with platform to conduct events like this that expand our understanding of science and research. Thank you also to Dr. Mendes and the Department of Chemistry for organizing today's talk. Last but not the least, a big thank you to all our audience for participating and making this event meaningful with your presence, your interest and questions that you ask. Before we end, just a reminder that the link for the feedback form has been put up in the chat box. Please do fill the form and submit. All present today will receive a participation certificate in a few days time. Thank you once again and good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think thank I can, uh, I can, uh, yes, we can sir. Leave, thank you. Know? Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure thank having, having you, sir. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. 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 Bye.